for this talk to be broadcast in New Zealand as they're very interested in disseminating some kind of screening tool for distress and like many countries they're not quite sure what to do so I'm going to summarize the evidence for you guys but the New Zealand group led by Hazel Nasir and Don Bacon are going to be able to receive this across New Zealand as a podcast later so I hope you don't mind the high-tech audiovisual aside here. So I've got quite a lot of material to get through, and I'm going to go at quite a fast pace, because you've got all the handouts, and they're virtually exactly the same as on the slides here. There are one or two small changes. I'll try and remember to point that out to you. So essentially what I'm going to do is talk about screening for psychological issues. That is perhaps the old school version, which is psychiatric issues. I'm a psychiatrist by training, so we tend to talk about depression, anxiety as clinical disorders. But increasingly now, we want to make our terms more acceptable to patients. And to do that, the way we approach it is to use terms which are familiar to non-expert mental health practitioners, such as yourself, clinicians working in cancer care, everyday terms that the patients will understand as well, like distress or unmet needs. But there is a question, do those everyday terms match on to those older psychiatric concepts? Is it valid to dispense with the ability to memorise you know, nine clinical features of depression, the nine symptoms from DSM-4, and just say, okay, patient reported distress, is that one way to go? Because that's certainly how the Americans are going. The NCCN are proposing to screen with a very simple tool, probably a lot of you have heard of it, distress thermometer, just a one item visual analogue scale. So is that, is that good enough? Because it saves us a lot of time. And I'm going to talk to you about what these worldwide studies show on that and also what our local studies show and Lorraine who's here today was a participant in that she kindly led the chemotherapy arm of the distress thermometer screening in Leicester though we also asked radiotherapists to uh, use it treatment radiographers I should say so setting a little bit of context why am I talking about mental health well about 50% of cancer problems involve a mental health component. That's measured by some tool and I can prove that in a second by showing you the prevalence rates. The reason I put this slide up is just to remind myself, okay that's the 50% of what? What what rate are we talking about? Remember we, we spent a long time talking about cancer incidence. So worldwide that's about twice the population of New Zealand who develop cancer in a given year worldwide, about 10 million people. But really, with this increase in survivorship, the increase in survival, led by you guys, the improvements in drugs, the improvements in early detection, leading to about 70% five-year survival on average across all cancers, that means that the long-term approach to this area is, is the most valid one. So we're talking about a pool of people, as you know, who are often doing relatively well from a physical point of view. And that, to my mind, an easy way to remember is that is the equivalent worldwide Uh, of the population of Australia. Approximately 25 million people worldwide living with, surviving their cancer, perhaps in remission. But here's the catch, possibly with psychological complications. Here's another catch, how are their relatives doing? John Gill, who's here today, is not just a videographer, he's actually done a study, meta-analysis of patients versus relatives, who's most distressed? It's not a core part of this talk, but I can tell you there's a surprise there. We found in long-term cancer survivors, the relatives were more distressed than patients, at least when measured by anxiety. At least when measured by anxiety. And it's it's a forgotten group, relatives, isn't it? So back to mental health, setting the context. Now the context of mental health is this. Your chances of diagnosis of cancer, if you have a cancer, the chance of you receiving a diagnosis is less if you have a mental health problem. The chance of you receiving treatment if you have a cancer is less if you have a mental health problem. How much less? Well this is a paper in Journal of American Geriatric Society and the lead author is Goodwin. If you don't have a mental disorder and you see somebody in a western hospital, in a western environment, and you have a cancer, 
the chance of you having treatment for that cancer is 98%. Now you know yourself, there are certain patients who you perhaps want to give chemotherapy, but they refuse. Maybe they've had a previous bad experience, maybe something's gone wrong in the family, but there's a reason, but you know that's in the minority. You know most of the patients you see accept treatment, 98% according to the US statistics. But if you have a mental disorder, particularly a severe mental disorder, like a psychotic disorder, for example schizophrenia, or perhaps a dementia, now that, you'll, that will perhaps ring true with you, then the chance of you receiving no treatment for your cancer, where you have a cancer and treatment is indicated, is roughly six times, six times the no treatment rate in the background population. So that's just a flag to say mental health issues are important. Reverse that. If you have a mental health problem, what's the chance of you receiving treatment for that mental health problem? Let's take patients who are in the hospital who have a cancer diagnosis and come to see you, but they're officially depressed. Somebody's recognized it. What is the chances that they would actually be picked up and treated? Well, US data again, and this is a good slide because of the sample size. Look at the sample size. It's, a, it's roughly 90,000 patients. Um, they compared patients treated with cancer and without, and then they all had mental health problems. What was the likelihood of receiving a treatment for that mental health problem within 12 months of the date that it was found? Well, the answer was one third, and it didn't make a difference whether you had a cancer diagnosis and were in the system or not. Two thirds of people with a mental health problem for the year preceding have not had any treatment for that mental health problem, and it doesn't make a difference if you're in the system or not. So we have to take that on board and think, well, why are we missing all these people? And is this somewhere where screening is going to compensate? Can screening compensate for this problem? Because GPs, primary um, healthcare practitioners and allied health practitioners working in primary care, have been looking for a long time about whether screening and simple diagnostic tools can aid this problem. Because they've got the same problem of recognition that we have in cancer circles. This was just to remind me that burden increases pretty much linearly with distress. So across all patients, we studied this in Leicester, we found 45% of cancer patients had significant burden, self-reported by them. Significant burden means I've got a problem carrying out my everyday life, I've got a problem with my studies or work, I've got a problem with relationships, or some area. It's a global question. We just asked for a very simple yes or no on, on uh, response to that, but over a large number of patients. 45% said yes, but it was linearly related to how severely distressed they were. If you had more distress, and this this is just a simple rating on a visual analog scale. It's actually the distress thermometer that I mentioned a few seconds ago. If you rated 9 or 10, then the chance of you having significant burden was about 80% rather than 40-45% in the general cancer population. These are, all, these are all cancer patients who rate their own distress and then have mapped on burden on top. So the more the mental health problem, the more the patient is burdened by that, by the condition in general, and the more they have problems carrying out their everyday life. Now I said prevalence was about 50%. I always want somebody to prove it. If anybody's presenting and they come out with a statistic, I want them to say, okay, show me the study, show me the data. Don't, don't just tell me it, because I, I, I need to cement it in my mind. So what is, what is actually the data on mental health prevalence in cancer settings? Well, we can look at two things. We can look at the old mental health diagnosis, like depression, and there's lots of studies on there. We published this paper in um, Lancet Oncology about a year ago, and it was a study of, was it 93? Yeah, 70, 94. 70 in general oncology and hematology, and then 24 in uh, palliative settings. And okay, you're going to know what this slide kind of shows before I show it, which is that mental health problems are quite common. If you look at depression as an entity, then you're talking about roughly 20%, depending on the definition. Apologies, but the studies tend to use American definitions, DSM-4, major depression. You don't necessarily need to know the details, but just take the take-home rate as about 20% depression. What about anxiety? Anxiety is a paradox by mental health diagnosis. It's actually low if a clinician goes and does the official interview, 10%. But by self-report, by the patient's self-report, it's very high. It's the highest uh, mood complication, as you probably know from your everyday practice. We can address why that paradox in a second. But anyway, the interview study said uh, about 10%. Okay, you kind of know that, but here's something you didn't necessarily know. In palliative settings, 
the rates are approximately the same for mental health problems. It's pretty much the same rate, the same rate of depression, the same rate of anxiety, and the same rate of other mental health problems. Not necessarily cognitive disorders, though. Now, general distress might be higher in the very late stages. And the way I sometimes understand that is a lot of these palliative studies have recruited patients relatively early who were treated with a non-curative intent. So they're not necessarily what I thought when I started working in psycho-oncology years ago, they're patients imminently dying. No, this is a broader mix of patients. So we need to bear that in mind when we look at these studies. Something you also do know, I think, which is if you follow patients with time from their diagnosis forward, they tend to improve psychologically. These are patients, like I said before, entering that survivorship phase where they tend to be in remission. They may not have a great burden from their disease. They might be doing very well. And they tend to improve. This is a meta-regression over time of the depression studies. They tend to improve. Now that raises a question in my mind. How far do they improve? How far do they actually improve in terms of getting towards what the general population would have? We've actually studied that, and John has been helping me study this in a meta-analysis of head-to-head studies. This is quite interesting. Head-to-head studies where they've taken the same instrument in cancer patients, long-term survivors, defined here arbitrarily as two years or more post-diagnosis. You can define other time periods if you want. Against healthy controls in the population. And it turns out that the rate, relative risk of depression in long-term survivors is not appreciably higher. In other words, if you survive and go into remission and don't have a great burden of disease, you tend to do quite well. You tend to do quite well from your cancer um, depression comorbidity point of view. In fact, there was an increase in depression of 16% only compared to healthy population controls. Entirely healthy controls, not primary care sample. And that wasn't statistically significant. In other words, you can consider depression in long-term survivors comparable to the general population. In other words, if patients do well, they tend to actually improve back to baseline. That's in depression terms. But you'll notice a second graph here, and that's anxiety. And every study with anxiety has shown a higher rate compared to general population controls in long-term survivors. So what this is telling you, some aren't statistically significant, but overall the meta-analytical rate is statistically significant. So what this is telling you is even in long-term survivors who, who are doing well without great burden of disease, they often have that background fear of disease progression that you recognize every day in your daily practice. And it's just worth noting that anxiety is about at least a third more, a third more in long-term cancer survivors. So it's worth flagging up anxiety as opposed to depression. You know, we've got so many studies on depression and so few on anxiety. There is actually a, a problem there in terms of interpreting the data. And if I summarize that, in general, if you divide it by time periods, depression is actually improving with time compared to the general population, whereas anxiety is actually getting worse slightly. And this is a paper in press now, in press, with Professor Simons as a co-author in um, JCO. It should be coming out later this year. So I've been talking there about mental health diagnosis, but we want to get on to general concepts like distress, because these are the tools that you could use every day without a great burden on you. You know, this is things like the distress thermometer, or one item, are you, are you depressed, are you distressed? Very simple questionnaire type items. Well, this is all the worldwide studies on the distress thermometer up to 2011 pulled together. So you can just see how people score when they have cancer and they are asked a very simple question. How distressed are you on a, on a 0 to 10 scale? And 50% score 4 or higher. And 4 or higher is the recommended cut that the NCCN in America proposes for the distress thermometer. So it's about this, all those pooled mental health rates add up to about 50%, or you can dispense with all of them and just go with distress, which adds up to pretty much the same thing. There is a question, is it exactly the same? Do they map on together? We'll come back to that in, in just a second. Now we published a paper just recently on lessons from primary care. I want to show you that in a second. But I, I just thought, you know, because we're talking a lot about screening, I'm not sure everybody here would 
necessarily agree with me as to what screening is because you guys perhaps think of screening in terms of mass surveillance you know colorectal screening or breast screening programs here I'm talking about uh, mental health screening or distress screening which might be universal i.e. applicable to all people who come through the door of your cancer center or it might be in high risk groups so-called parsimonious screening or indicated when there's a clinical suspicion also you've got to agree your target isn't it when you're looking for something are we looking for distress depression anxiety quality of life you know there's a lot of studies looking at quality of life screening that's important and then you can have add-ons like how much are they functionally impaired how much does the patient want help with that problem that's actually a key thing how much do they want help with that problem and I'm, I'm going to come back to that um, in a, in a, at the end of the talk so let's say you're, you know, you're a clinician and your hospital doesn't particularly help you with any particular method. Then what you probably do is use your own unassisted judgment, i.e. your own clinical skills, to recognize in your patients whether you think they're struggling from an emotional point of view. Let's call that distress. And it's based on your clinical suspicion of whether you think it's worth asking the question, are you struggling today or are you distressed today or do you think it's worth going on? You know, those kind of everyday, very sensible clinical questions. So you would actually be conducting a form of screening yourself. And the question there is, is it, is it effective? Well, Lorraine uh, Granger, as I mentioned, was involved in a study we did in Leicester where we started by looking at how good were the clinicians in Leicester. And to be honest, it was the frontline uh, clinical nurse specialists who actually did this study, starting with Lorraine's department in chemotherapy. So we asked the patients to rate themselves as how distressed are you? But then we asked the nursing staff, how well did you spot that problem? And if you take that cutoff of four again or higher on the distress thermometer as, as a possible worrying uh, complication then the nurses spotted on average 45% of the patients who were struggling using their own unassisted clinical skills. Now bear in mind we weren't helping them then. They're in a very busy department. Their throughput is huge. You know they've got a lot of other things to attend to. I, I or, or the hospital wasn't giving them an enormous amount of time to screen. So don't suddenly think that is a terrible rate. In fact, that is comparable to the rate that GPs get. Now, GPs also have a similar context. They're pressured, aren't they? 10 to 15 minute appointments often. They're not necessarily looking for mental health. They're looking for back pain, you know, everyday um, coughs, colds, and that kind of thing. Chronic disease increasingly as well. So it's not necessarily surprising. But one positive note, if the patient was severely distressed, then their rate of detection went up appreciably to 70 or 80 percent. So they were kind of going in the right direction with those more severely distressed patients. So you might say there, well, if they're doing quite well in the very distressed patients, do we even need to screen for those distressed ones? Who, who are we actually looking for? And actually, if they're very mildly distressed, do we need to screen for those? Because they're not suffering either. So are we just targeting that middle ground group? And if so, how would you do that? And now I'm talking about the burden of screening on staff. Because the next phase that we did was introduce the distress thermometer or our local adaptation of that which was called emotion thermometer which is one on one of the slides coming up and then saw whether it improved things compared to the baseline now we also were able because we were measuring multiple emotional domains to answer the question should we just look for distress and nothing else because if you just look for distress you're going to find 40 to 50 percent of people suffering from distress at any one point in time. In our study of 401 chemotherapy attendees, we actually found that it was 37% um, who, who endorsed four or greater on the distress thermometer. But you'll notice 50% endorsed four or greater on the anxiety thermometer, and uh, 25 approximately uh, endorsed the distress depression thermometer four or greater and look we've also look at anger which is totally forgotten in mental health and generally you know anger is actually a very important emotional complication and we had 20 percent of people approximately endorsing anger at a significant level now i throw these out as self-reported symptoms but are they significant for the patient well there you can do one clever thing which is map on how much burden do they have as a result of that emotional complication. It's a complicated slide, but I'll just show you what this basically says. Across all patients, 45% approximately had a burden of their disease. 
But if you were depressed, you had a 73% chance of having daily burden as a result of your condition. That's cancer plus depression, 73% likelihood of struggling every day. If you had anxiety, 61% chance of having a, a burden as a result of that anxiety. And anger, look how anger is quite high, 73%. And if you had certain combinations, you know, you had an 80 or in some cases 100% chance of being burdened, depending on how the dif- different emotions mapped on. But if you were distressed on its own without any other emotional complication, you actually only had a 12% chance of being burdened by that distress. Although any distress, yes, that is important. But distress on its own, without another emotional facet, that's probably not, it's probably not as severe a condition as we sometimes think. Now, just to backstep a, a slide or two, I mentioned a few moments ago, we, we started, before I came into um, psycho-oncology, looking at a lot of the primary care literature to try and learn some lessons. And this lessons paper came out in Psycho-Oncology, a journal which uh, is quite uh, influential in the field but has a very low impact factor, I have to say. Um, so what we, what we know from the psycho-oncology review about primary care lessons is that screening in primary care is basically disappointing. By disappointing, I mean the prospect of enhanced detection, enhanced patient-reported outcomes hasn't really been translated into real life. In addition, acceptability to the patients and to staff has been pretty much overlooked. So we have forever been asking you guys to do the screening with long tools like the HADS, Hospital Anxiety and Depression Scale, which is 14 items. Although it doesn't sound like much, that's 14 items too many for most people. So it hasn't really worked. So this question of acceptability hasn't really been uh, very well thought, thought through. And it's also not clear who should screen. Like, should the patient do a touch screen when they come? Like Edinburgh Cancer Scale, Mike Sharp has set up that system in Edinburgh where they do touch screen uh, system. And in other centres around the world, my colleagues in Los Angeles have got a fantastic system. Matt Loscalzo is the lead for that. And he has, um, with Karen Clark, done a fantastic job of putting an unmet needs type screen. Come back to that, I'll show you an example. But the key thing is what follows screening. You know, if you detect lots of problem cases, they're all suffering, they're all suffering. If you just detect it, it doesn't help anyone. You've actually got to go further than that and do something about it. And all these screening programs, they very rarely built in what comes next. And this is why primary care has also been as disappointing in some ways as other uh, areas in terms of the screening working. So this is just a summary of the primary care literature. This is out of your field, but I just want to show you just quickly that if you introduce screening to primary care, the meta-analysis, which is the meta-analysis of increased detections, shows that the GPs with screening detect about 20% more cases than, than without, 20% only. And it's on the borderline of statistical significance. Let me put that into ev- the everyday concrete terms. This is uh, universal screening in primary care applied per depressed person Without screening, they were detecting 36% across all studies. And after screening, they were detecting 41 So they weren't detecting you know, like 35% before and then 90 It was 35 and then 40 Rather disappointing. Was it worth the effort, you might say? And that sensitivity, specificity didn't improve. The ability to rule out the emotional complication in the non-depressed, non-distressed person, that didn't improve, arguably, arguably it deteriorated just slightly. So what, what's the story in cancer? Well, you've got to start with the tools. Yeah, you've got to start with the tools. And unfortunately, this is where everybody gets stuck because there's so many tools out there. There's so many tools. But essentially, we, you, can, you can be the clinician as the tool. You can look for distress uh, yourself, asking simple questions from your own knowledge. You can use a visual analog scale. I've just uh, mentioned distress thermometer. You can use a, a formal interview. You wouldn't do that because it takes too long, but I'm just saying it's available. And you can use a self-report tool that you give out to the patients or use on a computerized touch screen. There's also theoretically purely observation, but it, it doesn't work, so let's, let's not go there. And there's no end of examples from long to short of options. But let's take as a benchmark the HADS. And the HADS is the most investigated tool for psychosocial complications outside of quality of life in cancer. It's the most investigated depression tool. Approximately 30 to 40 studies on the HADS. It is increasing, you know, people are still using the HADS. 
Yes, it's unwieldy, but let's just look at the accuracy. If you take a ballpark accuracy of average to good, which I think in my mind is 80% sensitivity, 80% specificity, then the HADS loses about 10% on sensitivity. And that can be a benchmark for other things. I'm not saying the HADS is good enough, it's not good enough, and it's not acceptable enough. I'm just saying let's use it as a benchmark because there's so many studies. Now the distress thermometer's come along, hasn't it? I don't know if you've seen and familiar with the distress thermometer, but if you haven't, you are now, because there it is. It's incredibly simple. It's just literally a one-item visual analogue thermometer. Now the thermometer comes with an unmet need list of checklists that you check unmet uh, concerns that the patient may have that links with the distress. But just in terms of overall um, sensitivity and specificity, the distress thermometer loses about 20% below my uh, kind of typical 80-80. So the specificity is low. And you'll notice as a simple rule out method, if you think of negative predictive value, the ability to rule out correct negatives out of all negatives that a test shows, it's about 95%, which is pretty, pretty good. 5% error rate, 5% false negative error rate. And the problem comes in if you just use it to confirm a diagnosis. There it doesn't work very well. The positive predictive value of the distress thermometer is around about 30%, which means that um, two-thirds of your patients who endorse the distress thermometer are a false positive. That's an issue. Now, the quick, the quick take-home message about what to do about that is you have to then interview the patient more formally i.e. with your clinical skills or refer to a specialist, either psychologist or psychiatrist. It can be a good first screen, but it's not the end of the story because of this false positive problem. And that's, that's the essence of the problem with the distress thermometer. High acceptability, but low positive predictive value. Now we try to enhance the distress thermometer locally by adding in these different emotion domains. And I would like to say we are somewhat successful, but I'll actually show you our implementation study in a second, because I can't say we were wholly successful. Okay, implementation studies. So they start with diagnostic validity studies. Is the tool theoretically accurate against the gold standard? Those studies, there's a lot of them. They're a bit confusing. I'll just summarize them very quickly. The interesting ones to you guys are the implementation studies. Let me just describe what I mean by implementation study. An implementation study in this area is when I randomize a group of patients or a group of clinicians or one center to using a tool like the distress thermometer and I compare a very similar group, ideally matched group, without the distress thermometer and then I follow both groups up and see are patient detections improving in the group that's using the distress thermometer? Are um, patient reported outcomes like uh, I feel more satisfied with my care with my clinician, I have better trust in my clinician? Is that, is that domain, is it improving in the screened arm? So that would be a randomized control trial. That's a pretty good uh, but expensive study, as you know. We might also do non-randomized studies a similar design, pre and post, to look at the same kind of outcomes. I'm going to skip these. These are just cross-sectional studies on whether tools work. They're in, your, they're in your handouts, hopefully. I did put these in the handouts. But I'll just tell you that if you compare tools head-to-head, -head, if they cluster together on this um, conditional probability plot, it shows that they are working similarly to rule in the diagnosis or rule out the diagnosis. And the one that's furthest away from the mean line, that's the prevalence line, or no effect, that is the most, um, the most accurate method for ruling in and ruling out. So if you look at distress by interview by a psychiatrist and they say, which tool is best? Just tell me which tool is best for detecting distress and ruling out with a high negative predictive value. It turns out that the distress thermometer combined with the impact thermometer, which is actually a study that my colleagues in New Zealand have done, Don Bacon et al., um, is actually one of the best methods. But it's a long way from perfect. It's a long way from perfect. It actually shares a lot of the problems that others do. And it's not dissimilar to our emotion thermometers together. But if you want to say which is the best, just cut to the chase. For distress, that one arguably could be seen as the best. And if you want to say, this is not looking at acceptability, but just accuracy, then against depression in oncology settings, of all the studies that have been done, all pulled together, then just looking for depression, the very unwieldy, old-fashioned Beck depression inventory does come out very well. But just second to that, and very good in palliative settings, two items, two simple items, are you depressed 
and are you have you lost interest in a slightly formulaic question as on most days for the last two weeks it starts to get more complicated but those two verbal questions in the literature actually do prove surprisingly accurate that's accuracy not acceptability not patient reported outcomes for those we need to go on to implementation of these randomized and non-randomized studies so how many of these studies are there well we've just summarized this for a paper that's out last month in JCO and it turns out there's 21 studies in oncology or hematology looking at implementation of a tool for emotional problems or quality of life and unfortunately those those results are a little bit of a mess right now but I might as well tell you because that is where we're at at this point in time we've got 21 studies and there's 12 randomized and 9 non-randomized of the 12 randomized studies if you want to just focus on the high quality ones then we've got um, five studies that have randomized a group of clinicians to screening and a group to no screening. But we've got another seven where they randomized all the clinicians to screening, but um, the group who was, one group who was screening received the feedback with the meaningful cutoff score, i.e. your patient is depressed. Or let's say on the distress thermometer, your patient is clinically distressed. In other words, they received a meaningful feedback of the result. So then the, the comparator condition received um, no feedback. The patients were screened, but there wasn't any feedback to the clinician. It was another type of design which could elucidate whether the screening tool has an effect. Just to cut to the chase, we haven't done a meta-analysis on this because the, there's different domains of outcomes, but just in terms of categorically, how many were positive or negative? Well, only one of five of the screen versus no screen studies were positive favoring screening. Uh, four of seven of the feedback versus no feedback favored screening. And if you want to look at the non-randomized, as often happens, doesn't it? In the non-randomized studies, the weaker studies, you often get a more powerful effect, which is disproven or, let's say, in doubt from the randomized studies. So eight of nine were actually positive in the um, in the non-randomized group. So what's the take home? This slide isn't in your handout because I did this slide last night summarizing it for you. So of all the studies, the 21, we've got 13 positive screening studies in a cancer setting for, for psychosocial screening. One's actually negative, meaning it had an, a, dis, a disadvantageous or deleterious effect. And, what, and the rest are neutral, the rest are neutral. And th those are the randomized screen versus no screen and feedback and no versus no feedback group. One of the most well-known is published in JCO 2010, Linda Carlson from Calgary. And they did a great three-arm study where, uh, have I got that data? Yes, this is the Linda Carlson study. What they basically showed is the, the, the effect differed depending on whether it was lung cancer or breast cancer. But the best effect, the best effect was when the clinicians had screening, they had feedback, and they had a follow-up system. They had a follow-up system which applied, what do I do next, to that group. That was, the best, that was the best group of all. So it just highlights what I said about you need to tie screening to um, having what comes next. You'll also notice there are some British studies in here. This um, Bristol study, which is led by James Brennan, is quite interesting because they screened with the distress thermometer and also applied it in clinical practice using a treatment radiographer and or nurse but their, their, that, that study is, is brand new and it wasn't successful it was quite well funded but it wasn't, wasn't successful I've also tried to summarize here whether the screening was acceptable to the clinicians and that is all, also a mixed bag but I'm going to show you now some local information to what we're doing in Leicester and why we're doing it and where I think we're going for the future. <coughs> so we did our own implementation study of the emotion thermometer, which is the distress thermometer, plus the additional domains, there it is. We had a schedule of unmet needs, i.e. problems that the patient might endorse that would explain their distress. And then we also asked, unlike many other studies, what did the clinician do about it? What, how did they act? When they found the patient was depressed or distressed, how did they act? What did they do next? And this is for research. We collected the data, obviously. But in clinical practice, we just used a one-page, one-side screener. Uh, we ended up with 531 
patients screened by the hard-working frontline staff, initially led by the chemotherapy suite, and then expanded to treatment radiographers. 401 in chemotherapy, 100, 130 in um, radiotherapy. We had about 15% who were in a palliative stage by non-curative treatment. About 75% female, um, you see mostly chemotherapy, a whole spectrum of cancers. So what did our results actually show? Well, first is uptake. We approached 800 chemotherapy patients, but only 401 were screened. So we somehow lost, not lost the data, we weren't able to screen them for various reasons. For example, the chemotherapy staff said, this patient's too unwell, I can't do screening on this patient. Or this patient is really clearly distressed, I don't need to do it. You know, they were opt-outs. The clinician's still allowed to use their clinical judgment. So remember that when you're implementing screening, often if you, if you mandate the clinician to screen for absolutely everyone, they don't like it because it tends to override clinical judgment too much. But sometimes the patient was unwilling, although that was only 13% of cases, was the patient unwilling. Most of the time the patient was willing. The opt-outs were usually the staff telling me, no, you know, it's not really appropriate in this case. And it was exactly the same in radiotherapy. In fact, more so. More often we had problems, which is why our uh, numbers in radiotherapy are lower. And when we combined it, you saw this. This was the before. This is how well were they detecting distress or depression before. But we also have the after, which is when we applied the screening, did it enhance what they were able to do? Basically, were they able to show superior detections? Um, now, you saw the data from primary care, so you're probably not going to be too optimistic here, and you'd be right in saying that, because unfortunately, with the screening, we only saw a 5% uplift in detections, only 5%. Now, many studies just look at that and that's the end of the study and everybody's very disappointed and you, know, you don't get your next research grant. But we actually looked at other domains. We actually looked at other domains, not just uh, detections. We looked at communication. Now, this is more interesting in a way because we asked the clinicians at interview after every screen did that help you did it help you doing that or was it a burden to you and let's be honest you know doing something you didn't ask to do by somebody else you know imposing this on you can be seen as a burden it's a burden just in time so the clinician said that in roughly 40% of cases, the tool actually helped them. That's 40% of interactions with patients, not 40% of clinicians. So that's a lot of interactions out of 531. And in 28%, by their own self-report, whether they improved or not, the clinician said, that, that helped me uh, change my mind about that patient. I was informed about what was going on for that patient. So there, there's a percentage that is informed. Then we asked a global satisfaction questionnaire. Was it useful for you to do that screen or was it a burden for you? And it's almost like a rule of thirds here, but not quite because 43% of interactions, that's of occasions of screening, the staff said it was actually helpful for them. But they said in about a third it wasn't helpful. Now that third is interesting in itself because that is patients who are outliers very distressed, they knew it anyway, or patients who are very undistressed and they didn't need to do it. You know, so you, by doing universal screening, which is across the board, you do kind of override those two severe and very mild groups, which arguably is difficult to get round. And they were unsure in 21%. If you want, just take that home as a rule of thirds. One third helpful, one third burdensome, one third not, not sure. Of times that screening was applied, of times that screening was applied. So where next? Where, where are we going next with this? What, what's the future? Because that's the state of play for screening right now. It's a little bit confusing, I admit that. We've got the acceptability angle as well as the uh, accuracy angle, and we've got to mix those two together. But where are we going next is partly to look at this question of help, help, and that's either patient's desire for help or how often are the patients helped. So let me take the second one first. How often are the patients helped? And the staff gave me that data. Remember at the bottom of the form, what did they do next? So we have that data from our local practice. So this is interesting to me. When the patient was distressed or depressed, the clinicians helped the patient by their own report. I didn't influence them, they told me what they did. They helped the patient on, on about 40% of occasions. And on 60% of occasions they said, I didn't do anything or I didn't need to do anything. That is 
allowable. You can have a patient who's distressed and you think you don't need to do anything based on your own self-report. But just the headline rate, when they did something, and that could include just having a talk with the patient, or it could include referral to me, it could, could include referring to another colleague for help for their unmet needs. All that package together was only 40% of people who were depressed. And if you want to map it out in more detail, it maps out like this. That if they were distressed, it was about 60% helped. Uh, if they were, that's in a subgroup, by the way, sorry, I've, I've divided this slightly differently here. But the overall rate, any emotional problem, 45 to 50% helped. No problems, no emotional problems, they still helped the patients with an unmet need in 20% of cases. So what does that mean? What does that mean? There's a lot of people who are endorsing a problem who are not helped by their frontline staff. Now it's not because they literally don't receive anything, because I actually was intrigued why the rate was so low. I went back to speak with the staff and they often said to me, oh, you know what, um, you know, Mrs. Smith, you had a problem with fatigue. I just had a talk with her about that and I said I'd review it with her on the next occasion. So on the form I didn't write down I did anything. And I said, but you did do something. You helped the patient by having a talk with them and promised to follow up. I said, you should, you know, you should have put that down because I would, I would have recorded that as a negative. So I will say the staff undersold themselves. But across the worldwide literature, which we're looking at right now, their rates are actually about parallel to what we find all around the world in terms of how many, how many patients are not helped for their problem. Go back to that second slide on the number of people with a mental health problem who, are, who receive care within 12 months. Now one of the reasons that help is not 100%, and this is, this is a paradox, is that not everyone wants help. How many people do you think want help for their emotional problem? 30%. 30%. And why do you think the 70% don't want help in that case? They don't want to be a pest, they don't, want to, they don't want to burden you, they don't want to mention it, they're embarrassed. Those, those are reasons. But when we, had, we, we sat, tested this, we found 40% wanted to receive help, 60% didn't. The top reason for not wanting to receive help was, I'm coping on my own, which could include all of your factors. The second co most common reason was, I can manage with family and friends advice. And the third most common reason was, I don't believe I'm suffering that condition. Like I would say, you've rated on depression, you've scored high. Do you want help for that depression? We've got these resources for you. Uh, I, I, I don't think I'm depressed. I'm struggling, but I'm not depressed. So I don't, I don't want to see a specialist. Now we also said, who should you see? And the, the top choice was clinical nurse specialist, their own frontline cancer clinician, for their emotional problems. The least popular was psychiatrist least popular, 4% wanted to see a psychiatrist. Actually that's not surprising when you put it that way. 6% uh, uh, wanted to see a spiritual advisor. It's still low, still low there. Actually GP was popular for receiving uh, information. It's a shame Professor Simon's gone out. He said it all before you see. Uh, but the, the, the thing about the GP contact is those patients locally who you know feature a high proportion of ethnic minorities twice as many as the British white population wanted to have sensitive information from their GP. It was 62% wanted information from their GP, sensitive cancer or psychosocial information, whereas 32 of the British white population wanted information. Now their GP tends to be more of a similar ethnic group to the patient, and this raises a very interesting point about trust and communication. The, the patient wants to feel that they have a connection with their clinician, don't they? And they want to have trust in the clinician. Now you can break this also down into item by item analysis, which is really getting sophisticated. I don't want to go into it too much detail. But my colleagues of City of Hope, Los Angeles, have got this fantastic touchscreen computerized system. Matt Loscalzo is the lead on that. But Karen Clark is also uh, heavily involved. And what they have shown me, just the, you, you, are, you guys are going to be the first ones to see this data, because they've just sent this to me uh, uh, this week, is the percentage of people who want help in the largest sample ever studied for wanting help on an item by item analysis for every conceivable problem, not just psychosocial. So this is, if you have a problem, let's say fatigue or pain, how much of the time do patients in the cancer sphere want help for that problem? 
So let's take pain as a baseline. If you have pain and you go to see a clinician and you ask, do you want help? And by the way, they do give you different options. It's not just one thing. Then the chance of people saying yes is 30% to that. 70% say I don't need help right now. But they've endorsed pain as a problem on the computer. But they say I don't want help right now. But I'll, you know, I might hold it in reserve for later. But I don't want help right now. The number one item on all of their list, and they've got you know several um, scores of items, probably a hundred in the item bank. And by the way, the sample size not yet published. Nearly 1,500 patients asked all of these questions every time they come in. The number one item is I want that they want help for worry about the future worry about the future. And let me read you some of the other items. Feeling anxious or fearful. Managing my emotions. Feeling down or depressed. Feeling irritable or angry. Um, solving my problems due to illness. Talking with my doctor. How my family will cope. They're all above 20% endorsing help. But you've also got your everyday cancer items like problem sleeping. The number one non-mental health, non-psychological item side effects of treatment. I want help, I want advice regarding side effects of treatment. 35%. Sleeping, finances, herbal and complementary treatments, understanding my treatment options, pain, getting medicine, finding resources near where I live. This is a great headline for centres around the world. Although not everybody's going to collect this sophisticated level of data, it's still valuable to see. This is the percentage on the touch screen who actually endorse um, wanting help. Now there's one final puzzle. I, I call it a rate limiting step in whether patients want or accept help. And that is whether they like the th help you're offering. Whether they think the help you're offering is going to be valuable for them. Now the thing about mental health is we're somewhat stuck with these old depression and anxiety uh, syndromes and I started as trying to treat cancer patients from a mental health setting employed by the mental health trust and working from the old psychiatric unit well nobody wanted to come and see me especially not the cancer patients it was a nonsense you know my DNA rate was the highest in the trust and you know I was on the verge of being sacked so this, this the, the answer is look let's go back to basics first of all transfer the care to where they're coming where they're coming anyway that's a good first step. DNA rates reduced somewhat. Uh, second step, don't make them see a psychiatrist all the time. Allow them to see a psychologist or nurse practitioner trained in mental health. That's a good second step. Third step, what, what do you do with these patients? Here's a patient depressed, struggling with depression, acknowledging they're struggling, says, I don't want to come to the hospital. I get anxious when I come to the hospital. I hate the hospital. I want to minimize my contact with the hospital. I don't want to see you in the hospital and I live a long way away. What are we going to do for those patients? Now what we thought is, let's use the therapeutic tools that other patients have said are valuable and let's build it into a simple program which we call PACT, Psychology Assisted Cancer Treatment or just Difficult Emotions. And we use basic principles of care like rehabilitation, not, not anything clever, there is a little bit of jiggery pokery, cognitive behavioural therapy in there, but it's basic things. It's about getting back to life, improving quality of life. You know, you guys would be able to write this as much as I would. And we asked the patients to do this over six weeks, and hopefully we just got the money from the local East Midlands network to do this in a mini trial, um, to compare it against relaxation alone, to see whether it's useful. And then we hope to make this generally available. Now we do use it clinically every day, and it is valuable, but, there is a but, not everybody wants written information, do they? And not everybody can deal with high-tech uh, written material, even if it's written in a patient-friendly way. You know, written material is often quite dry, isn't it? If you're unwell, do you really want to sit there and use written material? So we're actually going towards a new uh, innovation, which is an everyday um, method of giving the patients information about how other patients coped. And we call this um, Cancer Stories. So Cancer Stories is a video program where we ask patients to give their account on video with consent and then we use this as a resource for other patients. I'm here with Karen Meacham today and Karen's kindly agreed to come and tell us about her experience with her diagnosis. Um, I think it was a breast cancer diagnosis that you yeah. had originally. 
What was the first thing that happened? I'm talking about going back to when you were well. What was the first thing that came up, if you like? Um, well, I first noticed the lump um, probably here with Mr. Bangs. September. Mr. Bangs has um, kindly agreed to come and tell us about his experience from his diagnosis to it's the current normal, time. You know. And I wonder if I could ask you from the start about your initial diagnosis. How did that come about? I, I went to a dentist originally to um, get a new um, denture made Actually, because kind of the upper denture was sort of rubbing a bit loose. Experiences. Um, the experiences um, that you've had have been some good through, things, but a few bad things in terms of complications and delays maybe that have happened along the way. And that's from the diagnosis of colorectal cancer, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Do you mind if I ask you how that diagnosis was made in the beginning? Um, I'd had some changes um, to my bowel yeah. movement. Starting with the pains in my shoulder. Quite a while, um, really. Obviously, as I say, you don't put it down to anything serious. Um, sort of went on for several months, tests and bits and pieces, um, and eventually, uh, obviously, found a lump in my neck as well. Then, yeah, as I say, you go through seeing the various consultants and bits and pieces, and they sort of pass you on to the next bit and have another bit done and wait for the results, um, and then eventually take a biopsy which showed up that yeah, they were sort of 99% sure it was Hodgkin's lymphoma, but obviously needed a bigger sample to be 100%. So then, obviously, then it was yeah, CT scan. Okay, so the, the program there is a video diary program which we facilitate for patients. We don't just focus on our own mental health patients. We actually ask the local clinical nurse specialist to send us any patient they think would give a good account. And I don't just say, give me this patients with you know, inspirational stories. That is great, but I also accept patients who have problems, who would be happy to share that information. Now we actually asked them initially, do you want to give this video diary for yourself or your own family? And nearly everyone actually wants to do that. We've had like 90% acceptance rate. And after that, we give the patient their own copy. And most patients who come find that process therapeutic because they get to tell their story on video and see an edited copy over 30 to 60 minutes, which is a you know, fairly decent account. But I also, of course, ask them, are you willing to share this information for the benefit of other patients? And if they say that, I initially keep that on a DVD file, which we'll give out to new patients. And we haven't, we haven't done a formal trial on this. We're trying to get funding in the next year. But just in terms of clinical benefit, nearly everyone that I've given this to has found it a, to be of benefit for them to hear the stories that are told. So people feel, you know, they're not on their own in this. Of course, they can come to formal group, group therapy, but not everybody wants to do, do that. That's, this, is a, this is a disseminated um, product, in a way, that will be out there. And you'll notice the website, the ideal, for me anyway, is to relinquish control of this program and say, let's put this on, online so patients can log on and get other patients' experiences so, I think we've pretty much reached the end and probably go, gone over time. So I'll just quickly summarise what I've said, which is basically implementation studies have been done. There's 21, and they are a mixed bag. The non-randomised ones do show a positive effect, but the randomised ones are split right now as to whether it's beneficial. The effect of burden is very important. The effect of burden is key. And we shouldn't overburden staff or patients by the tools or the method. But increasingly short, simple methods are being developed and they're certainly worth pursuing further. And above all else, you must tie screening to what comes next, what you're going to do next as a clinician, what's going to happen next for the patient. And this is where acceptability of help that you're offering comes in and desire for help comes in. And hopefully we'll get some of these innovative programs off, off the ground and available to everyone, including you guys. And therefore we'll be able to tie some maybe local screening that you do with um, a what comes next meaningful approach that's available for all patients. So thanks for your time, thanks for your interest. I don't know if I've got time for questions, but uh, that's my quick run-through.